furniture, musical instruments, functional art, beautiful decoration. These pieces, and others like them, are crafted in wood by master woodworkers who live here in Santa Cruz County and on the Central Coast. In this series, we meet some of these craftsmen and explore the paths they took to develop their talents. We will look at examples of their work. We will discover what and who inspired them. Please join us as we enter their workshops and watch them demonstrate the skills and the techniques they use in creating their signature pieces. Hello and welcome to the second episode of Woodworks Roundtable, the program where you, the viewers, get a chance to put questions relating to woodwork to a panel of master craftsmen from Santa Cruz County. My name is John Hall and I'll be your host today. Joining me are the same craftsmen that appeared in episode one, Nikki Singer, Ron Day and Roger Heitzman. All three are local artisans and skilled woodworkers whose work you may have seen in previous Woodworks episodes. If you haven't, then check out their websites that we'll show in the closing credits. You'll be in for a treat. Thank you to those of you who saw our first program and sent in more questions for the panel. Please keep the questions coming for future programs. Time as always is short, so let's get started. And once again, I have a number of questions. I'd like to start with one that concerns glue and how you stick pieces of wood together. We will be doing a separate episode um, on joinery, but uh, let's go into the, uh, the topic of glue. And this question says that there seem to be, or seems to be, a thousand and one different glues on the market. Which ones did the panel recommend for which purposes? Who wants to take a stab at this first time? Roger. Um, you know, again, you said there's a thousand and one uh, different glues, and indeed there are. It, it, each glue has its own characteristics and qualities, and, and the, the decision is generally based on what you're going to be doing and what uh, it, uh, you know what what the requirements of the project are. Probably one of the most generic uses or glues that is used in the shop is is Titmon. It's a yellow, uh, uh, I think they call it aliphatic resin, and mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really good all-purpose general glue. Uh, it's economically priced, it, uh, it works very well, and, and uh, does most things very well. It's the kind of thing, mm -hmm. when done properly, you'll get a glue bond stronger than the, the wood itself, mm -hmm. oftentimes. Um, but that being said, there's always negatives to, uh, you know, there's a compromise to anything. So tight bond has got some qualities that uh, make it less useful for me in joinery purposes. One of the things that tight bond does is that it will creep, or it'll allow the, it'll allow the, the wood pieces to move slightly over time with expansion, contraction, seasonal changes, and, and the stress on a joint. Uh, it'll allow the wood to move slightly with time, and it'll also what they call creep, where the, the glue will sort of bulge up out of the joint line too after time, with, given with time. Oh, so, so, so actually when the piece has been finished, yeah. and it's dried and it's cured? Mm -hmm. Dried, it cured, still, and there's a finish on it. It will still move. You go back months later and you can feel a little ridge at the glue, at the, uh, mm -hmm. the glue lines. Hmm. So I find that less than desirable. So a, a glue that I'm, I'm, I'm more fond of for any, any kind of a purpose where the glue line is going to show, I like to use plastic resin, which is a, a two-part, well, it's not a two-part glue. It, it is two-part and then it uses water, but you have to mix it with water. So that's the downside of that is that you don't just use it straight out of a bottle. You have to, it's a, it's a brown powder. Uh, urea, urea resin, uh, yes. urea formaldehyde resin. So it's, it's, there's a toxic nature to it too. You don't want to breathe the dust, but uh, mix it with water. And then it also requires temperature. It, it needs to be uh, at least 70 degrees. Right. So that's a limitation if it's a cold winter day, you need heat. Or if to, it's too hot also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if it's too hot, although mm -hmm. it, heat, heat just makes it go off faster. Yeah. But I don't mm -hmm. know if there's a, a limit to the, uh, to, mm -hmm. the, to the usability of it, but uh, that glue, when it sets, is pretty much permanent. It doesn't 
there's no creep. Mm -hmm. You know, you go back, I've mm -hmm. got pieces that I go back to, you know, 10 years later, and you still can't feel the glue lines. And it also machines very well with it. Whereas tight bond, it's, uh, if you try to sand tight bond, it'll gum up sandpaper because it's a, it's a thermoplastic glue. So heat will mm -hmm. cause it to. Uh, mm. What about the setting time? Is that different? Um, setting time, you know, tight bond has got a pretty, pretty quick setting time. It'll, it'll set, I mean, you can, you can clamp pieces and, and use them within an hour sometimes if it's a reasonable temperature, whereas uh, uh, plastic resin requires much more time, uh, I mean, hours, you know, sometimes, you know, overnight. Mm -hmm. um, so it depends upon the temperature and the humidity for glues like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm sure there's plenty of other glues that uh, you guys are familiar well, with. Well, I was going to well. mention real quickly that uh, when I did a lot of furniture repair and you'd knock joints apart and you would find the um, these um, like tight bond type of glues or Elmer's or something, they never really harden. There's always a, a certain kind of rubberiness to them. And you would notice that as you would be carving with a chisel or something and you're picking glue out of a joint and you would notice that difference between that and say old hide glue or mm -hmm. the, you know, the plastic urea resin glue and stuff like that. Isn't that good though, under certain circumstances, if you, uh, if you want to take something apart, to repair it or, mm -hmm. or whatever. You need that in some circumstances, don't you? Well, of course, <clears throat> it's nice. But I mean, modern glues make it so that they're so strong that you, you really don't have that much of a, an issue. At least, at least I certainly haven't found that. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is the assembly time. Um, if you're doing a complicated assembly, you want that extra time. And some glues will offer it and others won't. I mean, the, the, the setup time is, becomes a real important factor. And in fact, there are times in which I'll do, you know, like curved pieces with a lot of laminations together. And really the only thing that I've found that I can feel comfortable using with that amount of time is slow set epoxy, where you've actually got a chemical reaction, you know, when you're mixing the, the parts of the epoxy together. And then you, you, you know, roll it on or you brush it on and then you put it in the clamps and you've got, you know, hours before you have to worry about it, you know, when you, you've got that much time before you have to take the clamps off, for example. So this is epoxy resin. <clears throat> um, so if the viewers go down to the local retail hardware store, the epoxy resin you're talking about is the one that comes in two tubes. You mm -hmm. just mix it together and... Yeah, that's, you know. that's for real small amounts and yeah. so on. I, in fact, uh, you can get at, at uh, West Marine, they have um, a certain type of uh, epoxy that they use for boat building and it's it's quite handy for mm -hmm. furniture making also. And, okay. it, and it comes in sort of these squirt bottles that allow you to measure out the proper amounts of the proper proportions of right. the resin and the hardener. Of course, Mickey, it's also what a lot more expensive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what about um, whether, you, whether you're doing something for indoors or, or outdoors? Was that, does that affect the type of glue that you use? Mm -hmm. uh, I can, yeah. I mean, there are, going back to the tight bond, there are waterproof versions and non-waterproof versions. There's um, epoxy, which is by nature waterproof. Um, there's what's Gorilla Glue? Um, that urea polyurethane. polyurethane. Polyurethane, yeah, polyurethane. In fact, the a lot of the polyurethanes they have to react with water to set, so those are all you know nicely waterproof. Um, Polyurethane, I think, is probably less used in furniture unless it's going to be outdoor furniture, just because it foams up and. You know, it's gap filling, um, but it has other issues with it. Um, it's not water cleanup. It's yeah, also, you have yeah. to use like acetone to clean it up. Yeah. The same with epoxy. So it's messy to work with, okay. and you know, you've got to use gloves and be careful. Yeah. So I have a follow-up question. I haven't written into the program yet with this question. So, <laughs> and as I'm in a privileged position, um, I'm going to jump straight in and ask it. The type of woodwork that I do invariably ends up with gouges and dings, and hollows, and gaps. Intentional? <laughs> well, they're always, they're always intentional. <laughs> I, 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 I think aesthetically it makes the piece look more, more um, appealing. But other people sometimes don't, and they want me to fill in this gap and the gouge. Um, and one typical method of doing that is to mix sawdust typically sawdust of the same type of wood that you're making the project out of with glue, put it into the, uh, the, the gap, 
and leave it to harden. What type of glue is best for making that paste? Or is there a best uh, glue for that? I haven't had a whole lot of real good luck with that. I've tried yeah. different glues over the years, and I've, I've heard that technique, and you know, but I, I've had less than satisfactory results. So usually when that, I'm a, you know, dealing with that situation, I'll just try to patch in an actual piece of wood mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of the same if it's big enough, you know, yeah, thing yeah. into it, you know, rather than okay. trying. I mean, you know, so, I wish I could find something that or could recommend something. I don't know about you guys. If you well, usually whenever I've done something like that, I agree with you. You want something that's not going to creep. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and it also, whenever you add Usually, if you if you add water to it, it seems to darken it a little mm -hmm. bit. So yeah. you, if you're after a certain color match, you know, and you're, and you're trying to really get into making it so that this little patch you're doing is identical in color to what the wood is around it, um, it can be frustrating when as soon as you add the water. Well, pretty much anything's going to darken it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It seems especially like a light, great colored, idea, but... light colored sawdust mm -hmm. will get dark, which can work in your favor because then when you put finish on the wood, the rest of it darkens to that color if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. um, most of the times that I've seen it used is like epoxy or you know even crazy glue. If it's a you know if it's a tiny little crack or something. If it's a big thing, I haven't had a lot. I think the problem has to do with if you put too much sawdust in, you've changed the properties of the glue by putting all that extra binder and whatever in it, and so it doesn't set up as correctly. So I don't, okay. think it's, I don't think it's a good thing for big gouges. <laughs> so I've, actually, I've actually used a technique on knots, you know, yeah. where, where you've got a big obvious thing that you are going to have to deal with. Um, instead of trying to make it so that it matches the color, I'll, I'll use epoxy and mm -hmm. like a, a dye that makes it uh, Oh, I don't know, almost like a charcoal color or something like that, you know, and it and it, and it becomes a, a almost part of the design of the piece. You know, yeah, you can use graphite powder mm -hmm. to make it black. Okay, right. and you can you can even use um, concrete coloring. Concrete coloring, or yeah, or or powdered dyes, and mm -hmm. you can either do epoxy or you can do um, fiberglass resin. Right. You know, just you. Can, Mix it up and put your colorant in it, and then kind of pour it into the knot or whatever, and yeah. you know, build it up, and then you can plane it down. Yeah. Well, thank you for answering my question. <laughs> I, 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 I guess the learning there is that if if I go back tonight and actually accidentally scratch my <clears throat> Louis the Fifteenth period <laughs> piece of uh, family heirloom, I need to take a chisel to it and make it big enough. <laughs> That's right. To, to put another piece of wood in. There yeah. you go. Yes. There you go. Got it. I shall. Uh, I shall tell my wife you told me to do that. <laughs> if I were lucky enough to have a period Louis the Fifteenth. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to talk a bit about finishing, which uh, is quite a wide topic. But we've just been talking a bit, a bit about glue. I guess the one thing that you've got to be careful with with all glues is that you don't get it onto the wood that you are will be then finishing afterwards you've got to just make sure that you you sand it off scrape it off that applies to all glues all types of glue mm -hmm. yeah. yes there's no one glue which you can finish over actually i've found that sometimes epoxy yeah. uh, will so basically almost act like a finish yeah. you know yeah. and that so what when it's left on the wood it is already penetrated the wood and it, it blends in nicely whereas you know tight bond or yeah. any of the other glues if you leave it It'll block the finish from from right. affecting the wood, so you'll have a very unsightly splotch yeah. where the where the surplus glue was left on. So, mm -hmm. uh, but this is always much more noticeable if you are staining something. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Most of what uh, we do, there's not that much staining involved because you're using the natural wood right. and so mm -hmm. on. But it's a good idea and it's a good practice to always work. You know, and and once you're like cleaning up something when it's coming out of the clamps or while the glue is still setting up, is to you know clean it as uh, as, mm -hmm. as thoroughly as okay. you can. Great segue. Talking about staining, the next question um, talks about stains. But before I leave glue, one final question: None of you talked about CA glue. Could one of you describe to me what CA glue is, and is that something that um, that you use? in your projects? And if so, how? What's different about CA glue than tight bond or uh, res epoxy resin or, or whatever? 
I, I use it for patching, repair, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, small piece like that because it's instant. Yeah. Yeah. And and there's a, an accelerant that you can get that you spray on it, and it'll it'll basically make make it go off almost instantaneously. And so I use it for for those kinds of things. But I've found it pretty limited as far as trying to glue anything together with any strength yeah. for wood. You know, it was it seems almost ironic because it's it it has its purposes and it is extremely strong. But it uh, it's been limited for any kind of joinery or anything like right. that. So it's basically I use it just for patching in other pieces of woods and small assemblies that aren't going to be stressed. Well, inlays, much. right? Yeah, mm -hmm. putting putting exactly. inlay pieces in mm -hmm. stuff like that. And you know, you can get. They have gap filling where if you did have like on the on non show face you could you know fill a little gap with it. Um, they use a lot in, in guitar work, you know, inlay work and mm -hmm. filling cracks and things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember when Woodworks visited you, Mickey, in your, in your shop, you were using a, a glue gun to temporarily stick things together while you were working. Yeah, I would never use that as actual glue in a piece of. No. It's good for like like exactly that sort of thing. If you're temporarily sticking two pieces of a jig together or something, that's great because it's quick and easy. But I would never use it in a piece of furniture. It's just not strong enough. Right. Okay. Thanks. Well, I've mentioned the next question three or four times, so I guess we we should go on to the next question. Um, and this says that uh, I went into a store recently to buy some stain for a project. The assistant asked me whether my wood had been kiln dried or air dried. I didn't know. What difference does it make? It shouldn't make that much difference because you're basically talking about how much of the moisture content of the wood you know that you're the, the wood that you're going to be putting a finish on. The best example that I could give you is if and you'd have to get sort of specific about this. If you're trying to take a, a, something like a redwood fence board that is still wet and put a stain on that, uh, good luck. <laughs> you know, it's going to be horrible to deal with. But most of the wood that we work with, if not all, has been kiln dried and it's, it's getting its moisture content you know, down to close to 6% or something like that. And because of that, it, you, know, you, you don't give it really that much of an extra thought about is, is it going to be able to take a stain properly. It has more to do with um, <clears throat> you know, what type of stain and what type of finish that you're going to put on it. Um, I haven't noticed that much of a difference between air dried and kiln dried, but I don't know. Maybe you guys have. Well, at, at the moisture, like you said, at the, at the moisture contents that we're dealing with for furniture, even if it's air dried, you're going to break it down to at least 8 or 10%. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, that small difference doesn't make that much difference. But if you're using, like, a fresh piece of wood that was a tree six weeks ago, <laughs> then you need to take that into consideration. You know, but that would be mostly for... I would think decks and fences and stuff like that, not right. not for fine furniture. The wood, the wood needs to be dry. Yeah, I mean, that's the bottom line. Whether mm -hmm. it was air dried or kiln dried, it needs to be dried. And, and generally, I mean, I don't use a moisture meter in my work that much, but I've been working wood so long now that I can generally tell just by the heft of a piece yeah. mm -hmm. of wood whether it's dry enough or not to use. Mm -hmm. And if it's not dry enough, then it's not going to get used in the project. So it's generally it's almost a moot point, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. whether it was air dried or kiln dried, okay. whether it's going to take a finish well or not. Right. I mean, there are differences. There are specific uses for air dried versus kiln dried, even in fine furniture, but they don't really have anything to do with finishing. If people out there haven't got your level of experience and don't don't know whether something is fully dry or not, you mentioned a, a moisture meter. Yeah, there's moisture meters you can you H can how use. How do these work? That, they they uh, there's generally two prongs that that you drive into the wood and they measure the electrical. Uh, resistance between them to to gauge moisture, the moisture content of the wood, and uh, you know you can use those to measure. So like okay. Mickey said, generally we, we want wood that's going to be at least 10% mm -hmm. moisture content. Ideal is about 6%, mm -hmm. which requires kiln drying to get wood down. Mm -hmm. You're never really going to get wood down to that level uh, air drying it because it's only going to get as dry as the. Uh, uh, Relative humidity, you know, that's surrounding it, so it, it requires heat, you know, and, and fans to get wood down past that. So, you know, generally we buy only from reputable, you know, hardwood sellers, and they, mm -hmm. that's what they sell. Mm -hmm. is, yeah. yeah. Well, and that's the point is that it, most hardwood <clears throat> places will have kiln dried wood, 
in even most lumber yards, if it's hardwood, you know, oak, maple, that kind of stuff, is probably going to be kiln dried. The stuff that might be air dried would be out in the yard rather than in the hardwood section. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, you mentioned uh, finishing as you've been talking about that, and that's something that people are always interested in. And uh, I think somebody much wiser than I once said that you can you can make a bad, badly constructed project look really good um, by the way you finish it, or you can make a really well constructed project look very <laughs> bad by the way you finish it. And I think I've experimented with with. Uh, with with the latter, many times <laughs> successfully. <laughs> yeah. um, what do you think about finishes that are out there on the on the market? What, what finishes do you like? What finishes do you use? Uh, what's important about finishing? It's a loaded question. Yeah. <laughs> there's uh, you know there there's one thing I've learned is there's no perfect finish. You know no. I think that's what most people that ask that question that's what they're looking for. They're looking for you to tell them the one finish that just does it all. That's that's you know easy to apply, mm -hmm. minimal drying time, uh, looks bulletproof, great, bulletproof, yeah, bulletproof, yeah. You know, durable, all of that. But it just doesn't exist because mm -hmm. you know every finish has its strong points and its weak points, just like the glues. So you've got finishes that are very quick to dry. You've got finishes that are extremely durable, you've got finishes that are uh, flexible, you know, fussy to, to apply, but they their strong points are generally somewhat offset by their their weak points. So it, it does come down to uh, you know what you're what you're after as far as uh, you know do you want to finish that's you know high gloss, durable you might pick one thing. And then you know I think it also is it just like painting too. It's maybe 90% prep work. You know the sanding, the preparation of the surface, and all of that. Uh, uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, I've I've done a lot of spraying lacquer, and I've also done a lot of hand rubbed oil finishes. If I'm spraying lacquer, I might sand to 120 grit and stop. Anything more than that, it, it doesn't require. Um, this would be something more like my kitchen cabinets or something on that level. Um, but for a, a hand rubbed oil finish, you'll go through several different, you know, um, grits of, of sandpaper to the finest that you can get. It's almost as if you can burnish that piece of hardwood before you even put a finish on. It'll start taking a shine on its own, even before you start applying, for example, a, a, an oil finish. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would just read what Roger said. I mean. The question as to what finish do I use is it depends. You know, mm -hmm. what kind of service is it going to see? What kind of abuse? What kind of <clears throat> sun exposure? What kind of humidity changes? You know, th that all sort of factors in. Um, it, it's, it's definitely, a, you know, you have to pick your, your, pick your battles and pick the lesser of evils. Do you want something that's maybe a little more delicate but that really shows a lot of depth in the wood? Or do you want something that's, you know, a kitchen table that you want something really bulletproof that maybe is a little harder to okay. apply. Well, once again, time is um, time is our enemy. Um, could you give us just very, very quickly then an example of what what sort of what, what sort of project would you use an oil on, or would you use a polyurethane on, um, mm -hmm. or a, a lacquer on? Uh, well, I, a perfect example would be like a bar top. Mm -hmm. On something like that, most people, you've seen the one where there's a piece of wood under there, <laughs> and there's a, a fairly thick surface film that has been applied to it, either sprayed on or brushed on. Now, polyurethane, it's the same with floors. Okay. They, 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 they're strong, but you, know, you, you can't really feel the texture of the wood. That's so something I that takes out. a lot of wear, mm -hmm. the polyurethane. What about an oil finish? Yeah, yeah, I mean, a hand rubbed oil finish, I think we're the three of us, we're very fond of. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, if you're talking about fine furniture and you want to see the grain and you want to experience the texture and the beauty of the wood, there, I think there's nothing, you know, uh, right. beats a, yeah. a hand rubbed uh, uh, oil finish, which is just basically you just you're applying very, very thin, thin coats of whatever finish you're using. I myself like polyurethane, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, but it's very, very thinly, mm -hmm. finely applied. It's a very technique-driven uh, technique finish, but it's what really lets the beauty of the wood stand out. And it's yeah. always the same thing. The clients love the tactile feel. Mm -hmm. They just, you know, they fall in love with the the fact that they're sitting there just kind of rubbing their hand over it. When you've got, you know, a, a, a film of 
a surface film of, of varnish on, on top of the wood, it's not the same. You know? mm -hmm. So uh, you sort of like like you say, you, you choose the one depending on the durability yeah. and what kind of what's what's going to be the best for that particular piece. Mm -hmm. Okay, once again, I guess, as, as is the answer to many of these questions, it depends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. And who you ask. <laughs> yeah. Well, like I say, time is, the, uh, time is the enemy, so we've got to draw today's program to a close. Uh, thank you once again for coming in. Thank you, Mickey. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Roger. We had a great program today, and thank you, the viewers, for your questions to the panel and for watching us today. Please send questions for future programs to the address on your screens, and please join us again for the next episode of Woodworks Roundtable. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.